11, a drone appears above them and fires a missile at them and blows them up, the, this group of teenagers. And uh, if you look, I would encourage you to look at, at the photos of Abdul Rahman al laki online. And you know, I was Facebook friends with him and know that family well and watched endless home videos and interviewed all the family members. This was a kid who was a normal teenager who was not involved with anything vaguely resembling <coughs> terrorism. I say that with 100% confidence. He was into rap music, cart uh, comic books. He was part of the nonviolent revolutionaries that had occupied Change Square in Yemen trying to bring down the US back dictatorship. And he was described by everyone in his family as this sort of magical older sibling to his two younger siblings. And all of the home videos, including ones that were shot not long before he was blown up by a US drone, indicate that this kid had, was nothing like his father, nothing whatsoever like his father. And so he gets killed in this strike. And, and he, he, his grandfather, Nasser, gets a phone call on October 15th. And his relatives say, we had to bury them in one grave because we couldn't find whose body part was whose. But we know that Abdul Rahman was killed because we found a part of his, uh, his skull. And, and, and the reason that that's relevant is because this kid had an unruly head of hair that his grandfather and his mother were constantly telling him to cut. And he considered it his sort of trademark. And it was unusual for kids there to have this kind of hair. And he, they found part of a head with this big hair on it. And they knew it was him. And so this, this family, you know, the last interaction that Nasser al laki had had with his son was to try to convince him to go into American custody. They're raising this guy's kids as their own. And, and wanting them to follow in their footsteps of getting an American education and doing something, coming home to help their, their ancestral homeland of Yemen. They couldn't believe what had happened. I, I still can't believe that happened. It's so surreal of a coincidence. You know, I say in the film that it's like a story from Greek mythology. I mean, you kill the father and then the son. And, 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 and myself and, and several, a couple of other journalists, we've, we've, we've spent months of our lives over more than a year trying to figure out why the United States killed 16-year-old Abdul Rahman al laki Because the answer to that question means a lot. Was it that he was collateral damage? Was he at a meeting of terrorists, which is what the administration first leaked to the press? Was it that he actually had a fake Colorado birth certificate saying he was 16 and that he was actually 21, as a US military official told a major US newspaper? Was it that he was meeting with Ibrahim al-Banna, one of the leaders of al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula? Um, is it, is it that he was having a meeting with this dangerous guy and that in the pursuit of killing him, we killed him? Well, that would be interesting if Ibrahim Albana wasn't still alive. These are all the stories that they floated about why this 16-year-old kid was killed. And at the end of the day, the only explanation, the last word on this has been it was an outrageous mistake. We were going after the guy sitting next to him. The guy sitting next to him was his teenage cousin. No one has ever produced any evidence that anyone who was at that restaurant with them had anything to do with terrorism. So I, I have, a, a, a couple months ago, six, seven weeks ago, after the book was already at the printer, happened to meet a former senior Obama administration official. And I don't hang out with these people. I'm not invited to the White House correspondence dinner. I don't go to the super soaker fights at Joe Biden's house on the weekends with Chuck Todd and the boys. I'm not welcome in those circles. So it's not often that I have occasion to run into these individuals. But I ran into one, and I chased him across a parking lot, and he didn't want to talk to me. And um, finally, he agreed to answer a couple of questions if I said that I wouldn't publish his name. And I, I don't like doing that with, with senior officials. I mean, I'll do that with certain people that are in the military who are still active. I'll, I'll allow them anonymity. But I generally don't believe in allowing these kind of individuals anonymity. I think they should own the things that they're doing and not just hide behind being an anonymous source. There's a good reason to do that at times when it's whistleblowing. But in general, they just use it. It's, it's cowardice. So anyway, I agreed to do this. And, uh, and he says to me, when the president found out that the Awlaki kid had been killed in this operation, he was very upset. And, and, and this former official told me that the CIA and JSOC had told